So we've talked a little bit about neurophysiology in our last lecture and kind of got the idea that pressure waves are going to be able to modulate the signals in neurons. And so I think we need to talk a little bit about pressure waves. What do you think? The true foundation of the course, pressure waves. It's an important one, Kim. Are you nervous? <laughs> the students are really depending on you to lay the framework. No, it's good. We've got some good stuff here. I've got some animations and some uh, videos of some fun demos I was playing with. So let's just get into it, shall we? Sure. <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's talk about pressure waves. So first of all, what are waves and different types of waves? And how do we describe a pressure wave, characteristics of pressure waves, intensity, and then a little bit about frequency content of pressure waves. So a lot to cover here. Let's get into it. What are waves? Um, and so we're all very familiar with waves. A pressure wave or a longitudinal wave is a disturbance or oscillation that travels through space and time. It's accompanied by a transfer of energy from one point to another with very little or no permanent displacement of matter. And so you can really see that in this movie because you see the individual particle right there doesn't move very much at all. It has kind of a small velocity and a small displacement, but the wave itself moves at pretty big velocity and, you know, and, and, and long distances. And so that's really, that's really um, fun to see. It reminds Where'd me- Where'd you make that stimulation, Jim? I've seen this a lot of times, I've always wondered. <laughs> oh, I've got this really great software called Kinemac that I make it. Oh, nice. But it reminds me, of course, when you're at the stadium and you know there's a, a wave and it's like individually and people don't move very far, but then the wave moves all the way around the stadium. Yeah, maybe by the end of this lecture, the students can ask themselves, what kind of wave would that be? I already know the answer. But I'm not oh, that. okay, that's a good one. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about some examples. So sound, of course, is um, a, a great example of a pressure wave. And I've got tuning forks a little bit later in the class. Uh, uh, in this lecture, I'm gonna bring out my second tuning fork. But of course, if you hit the tuning fork, um, that one was, was, was damped too much. If you hit the tuning fork, then you can cause it to ring. <laughs> you tied it to a piece of floss. <laughs> Oh, it is thread. It's a very strong thread, but I will explain that a little bit later in the <laughs> class. But anyway, so the point is that we can create a pressure wave with our tuning fork, and that pressure wave is going to look something like this. It's sinusoidal. It's a pressure, high pressure, low pressure, a sinusoidal wave. And then, of course, that's going to go into our ear. And so we see it goes into the outer ear, and it goes... Um, uh, across the eardrum into the middle ear and then into the inner ear where there's the, the little cochlea and there's little hair cells in there that pick up the pressure waves and then sends it up into the brain, sends a signal up into the brain. So that's a good example. Uh, you you want to name another example? I'm supposed to have a, an example that you're asking for and I don't know what it is right now. Oh, oh to an another type of a wave, maybe? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> Let me show you this demonstration. Oh, this is um, a good one. You're going to love fun. this. <laughs> yeah, I was just playing around because I've got this little speaker. And the way the speaker works is it just vibrates. And it, you're supposed to put it on something like, um, I put it on my desk. And since my desk is a, a big wood box, it kind of plays it like a guitar, makes the guitar resonate. Um, and so what I did is I put the speaker underneath the cookie sheet here, and uh, then I played it at different frequencies. And so here's one frequency. Um, and you can see it, it kind of makes this pattern because it's setting up sort of standing waves along the, the surface of the, the cookie sheet. And by the way, those little white dots there are, are salt crystals. And then I changed it and played it at a different frequency. And now those pressure waves over here are making a different pattern. So they have like sort of a different interference pattern on the surface of that cookie sheet. And Very then cool. there was a, another one, and this one was really fascinating because this reminds me of the hippocampus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I had a different thing in mind, but I won't say what it is. Maybe it's like a cinnamon roll, it's probably better. What frequency is that one at, Kim? Do you remember? They're all around 180 or 200 uh, hertz. Maybe we can do like a astrology signs with our, our frequencies and see what <laughs> pattern comes out. Okay, so another good example is, of course, ultrasound imaging. And so um, here what we have is a, a transducer that's up here. 
And then we send out a little pressure wave into the tissue and it comes out through the tissue. And then there's a reflections of that pressure wave and then they get picked up by the transducer again. So we'll talk a little bit more about transducers, but it allows you to get kind of a, a, a beautiful picture um, in the body. And so here, what we have is a, a fetus there. And you know, one of the fun things about um, the, the fetus is there's this concept that there's continuity of personality from when they're on the outside and when they're on the inside. So if they're a thumb sucker when they come out, they're a thumb sucker on the inside. So that's what we see there. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about a different type of wave. And so there's shear waves. These are transverse waves, meaning that the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. And the main restoring phase comes, force comes from shear stresses. And so um, I try to do a, a demonstration on shear waves. I've set up a gel here. Um, I thought about getting ballistic gel because it's really um, supposed to be very similar to human tissue, but it costs a lot of money. So I just set up some gelatin here and I put some spices on top so that you could watch as I move the gel. So I'm gonna move one hand back and forth and the other hand stays still. And you see those shear waves sort of propagating through uh, the gel. I put it in slow motion. I, I don't know if you ever watch the slow-mo guys, but slow-mo is pretty good on the, the phone. And so you can see the one on the right has really um, a few more oscillations through it and um, kind of complex flow, but it's kind of giving you the idea of what shear waves are. Yeah, and if you're wondering, Kim has coated the gelatin in a time splice. And I know this because I've seen this video a lot. <laughs> great video, great video. So we have, we have compression waves or longitudinal waves and shear waves. And these are the two dominant types of waves we'll be dealing with, Kim? Yeah, yeah. But there's a couple more to talk about that come up from time to time. So I'm just going to mention them. Um, and so um, one is, first of all, you can get kind of a combination because you can have a compression wave that then creates a shear wave. So let's say you have a compression wave in the middle of the tissue, and then you can get a shear wave that emanates from that. And sometimes it's a little hard to think about, uh, like, how does that happen? But if we have a, an ultrasound focus that has more intensity right there in the center of the tissue, then um, you can cause that displacement right there. And then maybe you can, you know, create that, that, uh, that shear wave. It's one of the things we need to worry about in the future when we talk about uh, MR acoustic radiation force imaging is that you can be maybe creating those shear waves. There's surface waves. Um, this is uh, fun because, of course, we're all familiar with the ocean and surface waves. And the basic idea is that as the wind comes in from one direction, it's going to be pushing those molecules. And the molecules are going to have nowhere to go, so they kind of go up and around in this, this pattern. But this happens more at the surface than it does at depth, as that, hence the name surface waves. And each of the particles here moves kind of in an oval pattern. Um, you know, this was, of course, ocean waves. This was really fascinating to me when I went to Belize and I did a scuba diving trip where on the surface, it was pretty darn rough. You know, it was hard to get in the boat. The, the, the ladder would get ripped out of your hands. But as soon as you got 15 feet down, it was like really, really calm and still. And, and it really showed how it's like all at the surface. And the main difference here between a shear wave and a surface wave, because they look similar, we would agree. It's just that the particles are moving at depth. That's really at the interface. Is that, whereas yeah. a shear wave should, should kind of go through the whole structure, like the whole, whole part of it. Yeah, well, you know, the, the point here is also that the force is caused, is due to a compression. Um, and it's a little bit different than the shear wave, which is kind of a, um, a side to side motion. Um, these actually do show up a little bit when we um, can talk about the skull and you can have surface waves transmitted across the skull. Um, in fact, Rayleigh waves and Lamb waves are types of surface acoustic waves that travel along the, the, the surface of solids. And so you can imagine you've got your transducer and you've got that pressure wave that's now uh, pointing at the skull. And then you can, you can actually get those surface waves um, propagating along the, the skull. And so um, it's not something that we'll talk about a, much at all ever again in this course, but it is something that does come up and, and is of potential interest. 
in research circles. Yeah, and I think shear waves are gonna, I mean, even after this course, they're gonna show up more and more and more with ultrasound neuromodulation because as Kim will tell you later, we may be able to hear shear waves even when the ultrasound frequency is outside our, our hearing range. We are more, more to come. More yeah. to come on that. Okay, yeah, we're definitely, because we've talked about airborne sound, we've talked about sound and tissue, and then it's really interesting how the sound and tissue, you know, you apply the ultrasound to the, the head, and it goes into the tissue or into the skull, and then potentially stimulates the hearing system, even though it didn't come in through the, the air. So we'll talk about that when we get to potential confounds. Okay, so let's move on. And um, mostly we're gonna talk about pressure waves. So let's talk about how do we describe pressure waves. Um, and we need to describe the pressure wave as a function of space and time. And so um, this is just a, an, an animation showing you, it's the same thing we saw before. There's those high pressure points moving through uh, the animation here, the waves is pushing through. So we could say at one point in space, and so that's like, if you're, if you're at one point, you're making a measurement and the way we measure sound in tissue or sound in uh, water is with a device that's called a hydrophone. It's basically a little ultrasound transducer and then we can move it around and make a map of the pressure. So we'll talk about that in the class as well. If you have a hydrophone and you're at one point in space, then you can say, well, what's happening is a function of time. And what you see that if you're at one point in space that the pressure waves come by, you'll be high pressure, low pressure, and it'll trace out a sinusoid over time. So um, there's uh, some relationships that are always very helpful. So the period is the, the time for one cycle. So if you've got your stopwatch right there and you say, well, the time between one high pressure point to the next high pressure point, that's the period. If you're saying, well, let's say how many high pressure points there are that come by within one second, then that's the number of cycles per second, that's the frequency. And what kind of frequencies are we usually talking about here with um, uh, um, transcranial ultrasound for stimulation? Oh, it changes, changes often. I would say somewhere between 500 kilohertz and like 1.5 megahertz. And I've seen things outside of that range as well. Yeah. What, what do you think? What, what are yeah. you telling people these days? I don't know what yeah. to. Well, oftentimes around 500 kilohertz. Um, you're absolutely right Remember. that people there were doing experiments at less than that. We're doing experiments at more of that. And then there's trade offs. And we're going to talk a lot about that. You know, one of the biggest trade offs is transmission across the skull. And I have a whole lecture that's entitled Skulls. So <laughs> we have that to look forward to. <laughs> Okay, now let's get back to our relationships. These are important. So <laughs> the frequency is one over the period. And uh, the last thing here is the angular frequency is two pi times the frequency in Hertz. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about that pressure wave, it's a sinusoid, um, it's got some amplitude to it. So it has a coefficient that's the peak amplitude, the peak pressure is the amplitude A, and then a sine of uh, two pi over the period uh, times the time. So if the amount of time that has elapsed is one period, then it's gone through two pi or gone through one cycle of the sinusoid. And so um, just the uh, angular frequency is two pi over the period, which is what we saw in the relationship before. Okay, so that's one point in space, but we could also talk about how do we describe it at one point in time? So now I don't have the movie moving because we just froze it at one point in time. And if you say, well, across space, you can see high pressure points and low pressure points, similar to what we saw before. And it's gonna map out a sinusoid just like it did before. So we've got a sinusoid as a function of space. Now, if you say, well, what's the distance between one high pressure point and the, uh, the, the next cycle over, then the distance between those two high pressure points is the wavelength. So it's the spatial length of one cycle. So then you can say the equation for the pressure as a function of space or as a function of Z here is the amplitude times the sine. And now we have two pi over lambda um, times the, the distance. And now K is our wave number, two pi over lambda. So we have our equation there for the pressure. And next we're gonna put those together and simply say the pressure is a function of both space and time. So the argument there, 
the argument being the part in the parentheses is omega t minus uh, kz. And if you want to put in complex notation, that's what it looks like there. Okay, so the phase is the part that's within the parentheses. It describes how many cycles a signal has accumulated, whether you're looking across space or looking across time. K describes how quickly phase accumulates in space, and omega describes how quickly it accumulates in time. That's my phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well, while I'm talking. Hey, don't forget so, to turn your phone off. <laughs> and don't turn your phone off. I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that. So when you say phase, and students last semester got confused by this, I'm still confused by it. Phase is accumulating, but when I think of phase, I think of the point within the sinusoid that we're at, which is a sort of a, it wraps around on itself between, you know, zero and let's say 360 degrees. So why do you say it accumulates? What was the answer to this? Um, so, okay, so you're, uh, you, could, you could plot out the phase as a function of time and mm -hmm. the phase is gonna accumulate with omega t minus kz or it could be as a function of space. Um, so this right here is, is sort of the, the phase. Um, and uh, at one point in time, then you're at a particular phase. As time goes on, phase is accumulating. Hmm. Oh, you mean like you're advancing through the phase? Like yeah. You're kind of moving through it, but it's still part of the circular sort of. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. We'll leave it at that. I okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna confuse myself and others. Okay, good. All right, so let's keep going then. And let's talk about some characteristics of pressure waves. So the first one is the speed of sound. And we have the particle motion we mentioned before, and we, then we also have the wave motion. So the wave motion is what we're referring to when we talk about the speed of sound, the sound, the speed that the wave moves through the tissue. The particle motion is very small. The compression wave speed of sound is, is much larger than that. So here's some example numbers. The, the pulse or the, the sound is gonna move through materials at a velocity that's very specific to the material. So we see water and aqueous soft tissues at about 1540 meters per second. We could just round it and say it's about 1500 uh, meters per second. And then bone you see is quite a bit higher. It's, it's about double that. And so in the animation there, what we're seeing is that the bone, uh, the pressure wave is moving much more rapidly uh, through bone than it is through water. It's a little hard to see because what we're seeing here is that the, the, the particles in the bone don't move as, as much. And so it doesn't seem like it gets to quite as high a pressure. So it's a little hard to kind of visualize that wave moving through the bone, but it, they are moving twice as fast through the bone as they do through water. So the bone, the molecules in the bone just kind of are pushing away from each other harder than the water. And, and we have a term for that later, right? Is that a good way yeah. to think about it? Yeah, it's coming right up. You just really right. kind of jump in the gun here, just a moment. Okay, so let's talk about the speed of sound is of course the, the length per time. So if it goes one wavelength in one period, for example, then that's the wavelength over the period. And of course the period is one over the frequency. So now we come up with a very, very important equation that the speed of sound is given by the frequency times the wavelength. I know you're gonna wait for me to ask you these relationships, Keith, and it's coming up in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, I don't remember you asking this, I'm nervous. So the pulse is gonna move through tissue at a velocity specific to the tissue and independent of the applied frequency. So here uh, it's twice the frequency on the lower uh, plot than it is on the upper plot but they're moving through at the same speed. So you can see those high pressure points were moving, can I see if I can uh, play that one again. They were moving at the same velocity, as you can see there, the front edge is moving at the same velocity, twice the frequency on the lower one. So if you were sitting there with your stopwatch and saying how many high pressure points come by per second, you get twice as many on the lower plot. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit more because this is what you were alluding to. And that's simply that there's a difference in compressibility between water and bone. And what we see is that, see if the movie on the right plays, that with the water, there's very high compressibility. So the water molecules are gonna move pretty far before they give the energy to the next molecules. In bone, there's less compressibility. So the compressibility is defined here down below. So it's sort of the, 
um, the, the fraction of the volume change for any incremental amount of pressure that you apply. So as you apply the same amount of pressure for both of those, there's more volume change in the high compressibility material, that being the water. In the, low, in the bone, there's, there's less volume change and as we apply that pressure. So because there's less volume change and the molecules don't have to go very far before they give the energy away to the next set of molecules. And so that's sort of the, the same thing, that the bone has lower compressibility. And of course that makes sense, right? Because you know, you've, you've got your bone and you know your bones aren't very compressible. So now the question is, um, because it has lower compressibility, it gives the energy in the wave much more easily and more quickly. And that means that the velocity, that wave velocity is much faster in the bone. Yeah, I was trying to think of a good metaphor, but I think you already, you already nailed it. Okay, so, and now I've swapped these top to bottom. So now I have the bone at the top. Low compressibility at the top bone means it doesn't move very far before it gives the energy to the next molecule. High compressibility, the water down below, it's got farther to move here before it gives the energy now to the next molecule. So higher velocity on, in the bone, lower velocity where uh, in the water. So the speed of sound is given by this equation over here. So it's the square root of one over the compressibility times the density. And so when um, in bone, for example, when the compressibility is low, then K is going to be low, and that makes uh, means that the speed of sound is going to go higher and be, and be higher. So higher uh, speed of sound in bone than it was in water. All right. Um, since you didn't ask me any questions, I'll keep on going here. So uh, wait, is this? A, we're we're always supposed to say this, but I think everybody listening probably had in their head that high density meant higher speed of sound, right? Yeah, and the confusion I mean, the confusion's made because things that are dense normally have very low compressibility. So it, it was only associated with the thing really driving the speed of sound. Yeah. So don't and make I'm that mistake ever again, right? That's what we're trying to tell them. I'm going to show you the numbers in just a moment. But what we're going to see is that um, exactly what Keith is saying is that a very dense material, so something that has a, a very high density, and a very uh, low compressibility is going to have a high speed of sound, and it's because the this uh, the compressibility term sort of dominates. There's much larger variations in compressibility than there are in density, and so it's the compressibility term that dominates. Are there any materials that like compete with themselves? Something that's really really dense, but also very compressible um, to confuse people with sound. Yeah. Has anyone tried to do that? Is there a I reason for that? I don't know what material that would be. Okay, well, if anyone in the class thinks of one, please bring it to office hours, we'd like to know. <laughs> okay, so um, let me introduce a new term and that's the bulk modulus. So the bulk modulus is one over the compressibility. It is a measure of the stiffness, so that makes sense. Um, if it's not compressible, it's stiff. It's um, another way of saying stiffness is the resistance to being compressed. And so now we have another equation for the speed of sound. It's the square root of the bulk modulus over the density. Okay, so here's the equations that, or sorry, the, the table with the numbers that um, we were referring to. And so we could look at the density right here, and we see that between soft tissues and bone, there isn't very much difference in density. But what we see if we look at the bulk modulus here, there's a huge difference in the bulk modulus. So the resistance to compression is much, much bigger. And that's what gives rise. So that's why the compressibility term or the bulk modulus term is what dominates here. And that you see there's the speed of sound change. And in bone, the speed of sound goes up. OK. And. Um, and then this is uh, the speed of sound squared is the bulk modulus over the density, or what we saw before now is that there's the square root, the speed of sound is the square root of the bulk modulus over the density. Okay, so just as Keith said, uh, we're gonna talk about skulls a lot and the skull is dense and that's what we see right here. So this right here is a CT picture and CT is gonna show you bright uh, those materials that are very dense. 
And it really has to do with the sort of the electron density. We won't get into how CT pictures are made, but um, it more has to do with the density. So bright is dense. And, um, and I like to talk about skulls. They're just fascinating to me because there's all kinds of differences in shapes and composition. And you see this one right here is really thin over here on the sides and really thick, but I'm getting ahead of myself because we're gonna talk more about this next week. I was going to ask about that stuff in the middle of the skull, like between those layers, because I know you love talking that, about that. Oh, right there, the trabecular bone between the layers, because I thought for a moment you were asking me about the brain. I'm like, you covered that last time. No, no, no. <laughs> I know Kim loves trabecular bone. It's her favorite kind of bone. So I have to bring it up. Make sure she mentions it. But later All right. On, so here's our simple equation, which is very important to remember. The speed of sound is given by the frequency times the wavelength. So in bone, if the frequency is the same and the speed of sound has doubled, then the wavelength has doubled. It has to be true. So in our little animation over here, um, you can now see why the, the wavelength has, has doubled in bone compared to water. Because um, this number here went up by a factor of two. This number stayed the same. So that means that this number went up by a factor of two. All right. Now you should be able to, this is where Keith's eyes are getting really big. So he knows I'm gonna quiz him. You should be able to figure out these numbers. So here's our equation. And I, I'm gonna round the numbers so that they're very much easier to deal with. So 1500 meters per second is the speed of sound in aqueous soft tissue. And so that's given uh, on the other side, you can just kind of um, change those numbers around. So it's 1.5. Uh, times megahertz of frequency in megahertz and the wavelength in millimeters. So I'll start out, Keith, so you can get you get the ball rolling here. So if what we have is one megahertz, then uh, the question is, what's the wavelength? And so um, if this is one, one megahertz right here, then it has to be 1.5 millimeters. Okay, pretty straightforward. So let's see how you do here, Keith. Let's say you have a frequency of 1.5 megahertz. <laughs> what is the wavelength going to be? So we've increased our frequency, and so our wavelength must decrease. And I'm, I'm not even looking at the calculations. I'm just going to say one millimeter. Good. One millimeter. All right, good. One millimeter. Just flipping these things around. <laughs> I'm really bad at math, by the way. Really terrible. All right, that's no, like but this is really useful because let's say we're gonna use this frequency that's half um, the one megahertz, then you should be able to, in your mind, just very quickly say, okay, um, it's not 1.5 millimeters, it's gonna be three millimeters. And wavelength is something that we're gonna talk about again and again. We can talk about um, the, wave, the, the thickness of the skull with respect to the wavelength. We could talk about the trabecular bone makeup with respect to the wavelength. Um, we could, when we talk about ultrasound imaging, we'll talk about the resolution with respect to the wavelength. So it's something that comes up again and again. You know, for neuromodulation, we don't tend to use these really high frequencies unless we're using uh, an animal model that has a really thin skull. But if you were to use two megahertz, then you know that the wavelength would be half of that 1.5 millimeters. So it would be 0.75 millimeters. Yeah. When you get really deep in the field, people start to have a, an intuition of wavelength in different tissues. And the reason they know them is because if there's sort of an interfering material and it's less than the wavelength in that, in that material, then you sort of ignore it. And that, that comes up in some equations later. Kim, if you don't include the, the equations I'm talking about, though, I'll put them in. <laughs> okay. But um, so right, being able to good. do these fast is useful, is like Kim's saying. Okay, now let's keep going. Um, so here's an example of water. Um, now it's gonna move into bone. And just like we talked about, when it moves into bone, it's gonna move faster. The wavelength is gonna get a lot longer as you see there, and then it's gonna move into water. So that's the situation we have where we have our transducer that's right here. It's right up against the skull. Here in this case, it's up against the temporal bone, which is really thin. And then uh, it's just gonna move through there and then come out into the brain. So um, now the question is, um, what happens when we have not the situation that we just saw where that bone was thin and homogeneous, but instead we have bone that is variable thickness right here. As you see, some of the, the, the ultrasound is going to go through thicker bone than other areas. And right here, where there's all that variation of the bone, and, and what about right here? There's variation in the bone. 
And so what's gonna happen there? And let me play that, that movie again, since I, I stopped it too soon. And what we see, so as the ultrasound's coming from the transducer, it's all in phase. You can see those wave fronts are all similar. As it goes to the bone of variable thickness, now it's gonna come out at the other side. And now those wave fronts are out of phase with respect to each other. And so you see what's the, the ultrasound that's that's exiting um, the, the animation here. It's at a low pressure phase right here. It's a high pressure phase right there, somewhere in between there. So they're at different phases with respect to each other. And that could potentially give us um, uh, an aberration in the beam. So um, what does that look like when we have an aberration? Oh, this is just some words, just what I um, told you. <laughs> Initially, the beam is coherent or in phase. Couple words yeah. down here. Next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I put them there in case I didn't say it, but then I said it. But you know, let me read it anyway. <laughs> and then the end, the beam is is incoherent, as in the the different parts of it are out of phase with respect to each other. And I think you're about to show it. Yeah. Okay. So if you looked at the previous animation, these things are all next to each other, but really Kim's interested in when you're trying to get them together in space. Yeah, you. exactly. So what's happening here is that the transducer is going to be one that's um, probably focused. And so it's going to come together to a point. And we'd like that point to be nice and focused. And so you can see that over here, there's the, the transducer uh, that's, that's uh, here. I don't know why I drew it like that, but <laughs> <laughs> but you can see it's nicely so, focused yeah. to a point. And then as we have more phase aberrations, uh, in this case, then the intensity at the focus here is not as great. And then um, even more aberrations, and then the focus just really goes 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 to pot. Um, and so that's the effect of having phase aberrations. And so th that's what happens when we have a skull which has all these variabilities in it. Yeah, there's, I won't go on a tangent here, but it's interesting if, if you don't think about the phase at all and you were just holding an ultrasound uh, transducer to someone's head, there are just some people where treatments wouldn't work as good on and, and some people where it would work really well. That applies to imaging too. If someone has a lot of fat tissue, air pockets, things like that, it can mess images up. So in interesting food for thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of clinical experience with using ultrasound to treat uh, different neurological disorders with high intensity. And um, there's a lot of experience with looking at the skulls and like what's treatable and what's not treatable. And, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to bring in one of our clinicians and have him talk about it as well. Oh, that'll be cool. But nonetheless, the key part here, and we'll talk about uh, focused transducers in a later lecture. And we'll talk about the gain that you can get from focused transducers and, and just the fact here that um, because the speed of sound is different in the skull and you have skulls of variable thickness that you can get these aberrations that mean that you're, you, you no longer get a very good focus. All right, so now I'm gonna change gears a little bit and talk a, a little bit more about some of the effects of the skull um, due to the different speed of sound and some other effects that they could have. So here, what I'm gonna talk about is Snell's law. And this is the law that, that governs the idea of refraction. And the idea here is that your ultrasound, if it's not coming in exactly perpendicular to the interface between tissues of different speed of sound, so here, soft tissue moving into bone, but if it's actually at an angle, then what we see is that when it goes through that interface, then that angle can change. And so there's a very simple, elegant equation for how that angle changes. And so what you see is that the, the sign of the incident angle divided by the sign of the transmitted angle is related to the difference, the, the ratio of the speed of sound. So here in the situation where we're moving in soft tissue, remember we've talked about the speed of sound being about 1500 meters per second, moving into bone, that's about 3000 meters per second. And then what we see is that it's gonna move uh, into a speed of sound, which is gonna double. So now the, the transmitted angle is about double. And that's what we see here is that now the transmitted beam is moving away from the normal. Um, so that's what happens when you transmit into the skull 
And then when you transmit from the skull back into soft tissue, into the brain, for example, then the opposite sort of happens because we're going from that 3000 uh, meters per second and now moving into 1500 meters per second. And so what we see is that it, it kind of gets bent back towards the normal again. Um, so on this one, it's I have this nice analogy this one's a little bit easier to understand because let's pretend you're you're a car and beside the the road there's there's gravel and as the car the the course the the gravel has a, a slower speed of sound so this right here let's say this is the gravel and up here that you're on the road and so you have a higher speed on the road and as your car maybe one wheel slips into the gravel then it's kind of intuitive that you know that the car is going to kind of turn into the gravel and so that's sort of what's happening here is that front wheel uh, hits into the gravel, then, then, then the car sort of turns in. So that kind of makes sense. Well, at least it does to me. Does that make sense to you, Keith? It does. It does. I, I remember this from like intro to physics in high school when they taught it with optics. So some principles between the two wave types hold up. Look at that. It's exactly the same as in the- Oh my the goodness. Did we plan that? I don't know if we planned that. You guys remember <laughs> that from an old lecture. Yeah, so that's exactly what's happening here. Because when you look at that, um, the chopstick, it's, it's not exactly straight. It gets bent because the speed of light is different in the water than it was in the I water. love how all of the like metaphorical demos are just in your kitchen. <laughs> it's like this like gelatin cake and the <laughs> chopstick in a bowl of water. You got to keep doing that. I think it's great. It's character. <laughs> all right. Yeah, you can see the toaster in the background. <laughs> You left the toaster on the coffee pot. <laughs> couldn't be bothered to <laughs> scoot that out. No, <clears> I, <throat> I, I couldn't be bothered. Well, I did. Take <laughs> hey, let's move on. <laughs> let's talk about acoustic impedance. And again, this is going to be a ramification of having a different speed of sound as well um, as density. And, you know, here's a question. You may be saying, why are you showing me a picture of a mouse? <laughs> <What is this>? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like... it's not even the whole mouse. It's just the mouse's tail. I'm not even showing There's you. There's a mouse and a toaster oven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, this is really important because what we have is the transducers up here. And this is what we call a coupling cone. So this is a, just a, it's hollow. It can be printed, uh, made of plastic, and it allows us to have the ultrasound come through degassed water. And then right here, there's a, a membrane, maybe it's saran wrap, and then there's uh, some ultrasound gel, and then it, it uh, goes onto the animal. And so the key here is like, why do we do all of this? Why do we have um, all of this, uh, the coupling cone and the water and, and the gel? And that's what I'm going to tell you about now because we can't really have a situation where there's an air gap. And so why, why, why can we not have an air gap? Okay, there's the question. <laughs> Some words came up again. Why do we have coupling oh, gel? Do you, do you show more refraction or just you're just saying you can't have the air gap because? You can't have the air gap. Now, I'm gonna tell you why. Because when you have two materials that have different acoustic impedance, then you're going to have a big reflection. And so, okay, let's back up. Let's unpack that. What is acoustic impedance? Acoustic impedance is um, given by this equation. It's the ratio between the pressure that you apply and the particle velocity. And you can kind of think of it sort of like a resistance. Um, and so, you know, as you apply pressure, then the, the particle velocity goes up only in relation to the resistance that, that, that you have. And um, so, and we've already talked about resistance because we talked about the bulk modulus being resistance to uh, compression. So, um, so there's another equation right here for the acoustic impedance, which is related to the bulk modulus times the density. And then we can just uh, put in our relationship here where um, this one over here uh, that we talked about before. And now we're going to come up with an equation right here for the acoustic impedance equal to the density times the speed of sound. And this is an equation that's much easier to deal with than the other equations and is one that is much more commonly used. So what we have here 
<laughs> why did I get into all this? Is we have two materials. We've got water, we've got bone or aqueous soft tissue and bone. And they're gonna have different acoustic impedances because they've got different densities and different speeds of sound. And we're gonna talk about why that matters. Different acoustic impedances are gonna matter. Um, so in fact, you can come up with the, here's a little table where we have uh, the densities. We've talked about the density not being terribly different between those two materials. Uh, the speed of sound is different. The bulk module is very different. And now that's gonna give rise to the impedance numbers. Um, I'll have to remember not to uh, put anything at the bottom of my slides since my little uh, pencil thing comes up there. Oh, the can slide. they see that? Can, can the video yeah. see that? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, viewers. Um, I'll do my best in the future to uh, not get, not put things at the bottom. <laughs> All right, let's talk about acoustic impedance. So we have two different materials. We've got water, we've got bone. They have different acoustic impedances. And the question is now, what difference does that make? And it turns out that you're going to have a lot of reflection at interfaces with two different acoustic impedances. And you know that's true because when I talk at the wall, the wall has got a different acoustic impedance than the air. There's going to be a reflection coming back at the wall, right? So you know this is true. <laughs> so here we go where we have um, our sound that's going to go through our coupling gel. And then Z2 is maybe the skull. And what we're going to see is there's, there's going to be a reflection at that interface. And so that well, reflection means that some of it's gonna come reflecting back, some of it's gonna get transmitted through and how much gets transmitted through and how much gets reflected depends on those specific numbers of the acoustic impedance. And by the way, at that second interface, you can have the exact same thing happen again. So some of it's gonna get transmitted through, some of it's gonna get reflected back. And so that's exactly what's happening in the skull. If you have a transducer on the skull, then as you send the sound wave in, there's gonna be a reflection back from the first surface, some's gonna get transmitted through, reflection back from the second surface, some's gonna get transmitted through. All right, so how much depends on what those specific numbers. So here's an equation for the reflection. And this equation has to do for the reflection, the in intensity reflection. But what you see here is that it's the difference of the acoustic impedances squared over the sum squared. So in other words, you can have a big reflection when those numbers are very, very different. Oh, I was, I was just really quickly gonna mention the uh, heating of the skull comes up a lot in this field. The skull seems to get hotter than the other tissue, even though waves just traveling through it. And that's because Kim described the sound bouncing backwards, but it can keep doing that within the skull. So those white arrows can keep the sound all inside. So as long as this, you know, the sound's traveling in the skull, it's heating it up and, and you just get this internal bounce. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. It can really bounce around in there mm -hmm. and, uh, and that can give rise to heating. And plus the skull bone is uh, very absorbing and that'll give rise to heating as well. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more next lecture that I called mm -hmm. Skulls. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a new name, it's very good, very descriptive. All right, so let's talk about the specific numbers. So remember I said that the acoustic impedance is the um, density times the speed of sound. And so then now we have another column here for the impedance. And uh, this is, it's the, the units are rails um, or um, here it's given in mega rails. So that's 10 to the six times the rails. And so you can see that the numbers right there, um, air has a very, very low acoustic impedance because the density is really low. Um, and then you, so whenever there's a, an interface between air and aqueous soft tissues, you can have a lot of reflection. So that's why we can't have any air uh, between the transducer and uh, the subject, because you're just gonna have a lot of reflection. So we wanna just make sure that it goes completely through um, aqueous material. So that we put that coupling gel and that coupling cone. Now, between the aqueous soft tissue and the bone that we have when we're transmitting across the skull, there's nothing we can really do about that exactly. So we just kind of have to put up with that. What we do see is that there's going to be a lot of reflection at that interface. And so understanding that is uh, something that we're going to talk about for a whole lecture called skulls. <laughs> it, it's kind of amazing we can hear sound across walls or doors at all. I mean, with these kind of reflections. Is there like some sort of logarithmic at play when you're thinking about hearing? 
99.9 percent i mean they're so different i don't know i'm, I'm just there thinking I'll absolutely is a logarithm at play uh, uh, absolutely you you have this huge dynamic range in what you can hear and um and it's not linear um so you can hear very small sounds that are order many orders of magnitude smaller than what you know the loud, loudest sounds yeah 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 that's interesting um, okay, so just look at some numbers here. So what's the percent of the intensity is reflected back in an air aqueous tissue interface, like almost all of it. So this is one of the reasons why we cannot sonicate through our sinuses, because there's just going to be complete reflection at that air interface on the inside. It, you, you do know we have air inside our heads, right? So there's this thing about air heads. No, sorry. <laughs> that was a stupid joke. <laughs> Maybe it was, uh, it was <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's keep going. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, what about hair? Okay, so hair is a bit of a problem. And one of the problems is that hair can harbor air bubbles. And so you get little air bubbles in there, then that means that you might have a lot of reflection before the ultrasound gets transmitted uh, into the, the skin. So there's been a lot of work. There was um, a conference I went to um, in Barcelona and there was a poster. I can't remember who did the poster, but there was a great poster talking about different hair preparations that would allow you to get rid of the air bubbles because you know we're very interested in being able to uh, do transcranial ultrasound uh, without having to um, get rid of the hair, i.e. shave the hair off. So um, oftentimes with the animal models, we don't care. Let's just get rid of the hair. So you often see um, animals that, you know, the hair is shaved or have a depilatory cream. Um, but with humans, we're just really interested to see what we can do about the hair. And so using something that just kind of reduces those um, air bubbles would be a good idea. Okay, so let's talk a bit about uh, seemed out of place to talk about the, the hair right in the middle of acoustic impedance, but that was because we were talking about air. Uh, but let's just talk about some other interfaces here. And what are the specific numbers? So here, like fat and muscle. So for example, you, you have muscles on the side of your head. Um, did you know that? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I know there's like a lot of they, they help you talk and move your jaw, right? So you got muscles right here. So you got skin and muscle and you get, you know, the ultrasound is going to go right through the fat muscle interface. But then mm -hmm. when it gets to the aqueous soft tissue bone interface, then you're going to get a lot of reflection. Okay. Um, so this is, a, this is true for normal incidence and normal incidence, of course, when it's going perpendicular to that interface. But what about when it's at an angle? Yeah, and you're gonna you're really gonna hate me for this, but it comes up all the time the further you get in. If that Z2 layer in Kim's image there is really, really thin, like let's say much smaller than the wavelength, then that can actually affect how much reflection you get. And there's an equation I'm gonna bring back to that later, but that's a little more complicated than we're gonna talk about right now. Okay. Do you hate good. that I just said that, Kim? Do you agree with it or yeah, yeah, yeah. But most skulls, we need to worry about it because now let's think about it. The thinnest skull I've ever seen, I think it has to be maybe like three millimeters is the thinnest skull. And okay. then if you have a frequency of one megahertz, then your wavelength is 1.5 millimeters. So mm -hmm. it's double the wavelength. And then if you go down to 500 kilohertz, then it's about the same in wavelength. So we need to worry about the skull, but you're yeah, right. For the most part. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, what about when the ultrasound is coming at an angle and it's not normal incidence? I really loved how you just did the equation. We talked about doing this on the fly and you thought, you know what, we got to worry about it. It's just too, too big an interface. So the students should do this as well, I think. Okay. Yeah. So this is really fun. Um, and maybe we'll, see if we can put this into a homework, but here's the idea that um, if the uh, um, transmission is not a perpendicular in, uh, incidence, but it's coming in at an angle, then what you're going to see is you're going to have more and more reflected. And how much is reflected is shown on the plot right here. So um, the bone, fat bone interface, these are the specific numbers that I've typed in in this little uh, simulation here. And we see in normal incidence, we get about 40% reflected. But now as the angle increases, so that's the angle from the normal, then what you see is that now we're going really up to almost complete reflection. 
And so this point right at there at the top uh, where you have uh, complete reflection is sort of the critical angle. And so what this is saying is that it really matters how we put our transducer on the skull and not just that we have it sort of as flat as we can to the skull on the outside, but those angles on the inside, which aren't always very flat, really matter. So, um, you know, there'll be some point where I'm gonna post some material where we can actually get in and derive some of this stuff, but I'm gonna keep it out of the main lecture because I think this is kind of the key take home point um, that this plot and that, uh, that really uh, not very large angle here, it's about 27 degree angle, you're gonna have complete reflection. And so that's sort of the, the key take home. Did you have something you wanted to say? <laughs> nah, I can't think of anything. Um, I was actually just wondering if you're thinking about imaging versus therapeutic ultrasound or neuromodulation, um, why don't people image through the skull? Is it because of the reflections or the phase aberration correction? What, what's the biggest player there? Like, I, And I know people do image through the skull, but the, the images don't usually look very good. All of the above. And what makes it even harder for ultrasound imaging than it for us is that you have to go two ways. You have to send an ultrasound pulse across the skull to get inside, have the reflection then, uh, so the pulse will come through and then have the reflection come back as well. And so even if you can deal with it on the one way and, and you've got all that, um, the aberration to deal with, the attenuation, you've got two-way attenuation. And so it just means there's very, very large losses. And the signal that comes back to the transducer is going to be very, very small. Yeah. And that's not to say people aren't trying to do this. So if you're looking for new, uh, exciting challenges, imaging the brain through the skull is, if maybe you talk to Kim about it, up and coming. Yeah, I can point you to some people to talk to. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep on going here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about intensity because I've mentioned intensity, but I haven't really defined it yet. So let's define it. Um, before we define it, there's this concept of energy. Um, everybody knows what, what energy is, is the ability to do work. Uh, power is the energy per time. So it's sort of the, the time derivative of the energy. And then intensity is the, um, uh, the power per area. So um, uh, it's a little bit of a mouthful getting all to make sense of all this. So energy like <laughs> that is the ability to do work. Work is uh, the force in order to move something a distance of D. And so um, then the time derivative of the energy is the power. And then the intensity is how much uh, power you have spread out over what area. And so that, that's sort of the definition of intensity. Um, so we can kind of um, move that around a little bit. So um, that's the force. Uh, so um, taking energy now is the work or the force times the distance um, gives us that equation. And then what we have is the, uh, um, the, the force per area, which is the pressure and then the distance per time, and that's the particle velocity. And so our intensity now is the pressure times the particle velocity, which isn't actually a number that I use or an equation I use very often. It's not really very handy, but we can use this equation that we've talked about where uh, the acoustic impedance is the pressure over the particle velocity. And now what we see is the intensity is the pressure squared over the acoustic impedance. And so that's an equation that's much easier to use and much more intuitive and more commonly used. Okay, so this is the instantaneous intensity. And you can ask me what I mean by that? Yeah, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Actually, Kim, wait, let's back up for just two seconds. So okay. if we're, the most important equation that I know that I use quite a bit is I equals the pressure squared over the impedance, the acoustic impedance. So let's just think about what that means. So the larger the pressure or like the distortion of these materials gives us a higher intensity. But if the material is even stiffer, then you can have a little less distortion and still have the same amount of energy kind of 
trying to work the material in that shape, right? Okay, so it won't always look the same, but you can get um, sort of the same outcome with those two characteristics. Yeah. Now, if you think about the wave that was uh, going um, through the aqueous soft tissue into bone and then back into aqueous soft tissue, it looked different in bone. And then when it came out on the other side, it went back to looking how it did before in terms of like the wavelength and the velocity. Okay. So those had the same intensity though, in both materials. Well, assuming in, there was no loss. <laughs> yeah, right. In reality, there's going to be losses across the skull. We got a whole lecture coming up on skulls. <laughs> yeah. you can't wait for that, that lecture. Um, okay. So I have my head wrapped around it. I hope everyone else does. What's it, What about that instantaneous, Ken? Okay, Let's yeah, so that, that just means at, uh, um, at every point in time. So if you were to say, um, let, let me let me just let you, uh, change the slide over to this one. So what we have here on the upper plot is the pressure. So the pressure here is a sinusoid and it's as a function of time. So the, the pressure is changing as a function of time. So down below is our normalized intensity. So in other words, it's a sinusoid squared. It's a little hard to tell exactly, but this is a... Um, the, the pressure squared, and then it's, it should be over Z, but I've normalized it, so it only goes up to one. Um, but when I say the instantaneous intensity, that means at any one point in time. So it's, it's changing over time at any one point in time. It's given by the pressure squared at that point in time. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so we can talk about some other numbers. So we can talk about the, the peak pressure so oftentimes we talk about the, the peak positive pressure or the peak compressional pressure. Um, and then that's a little bit different than the, the peak negative pressure or the peak rare fraction. I keep saying that with an R, rare, rare fraction pressure. <laughs> Wait, so is, sorry, Kim, is the, the P uh, value in that equation referring to the positive or the negative pressure? Did you already say that? Well, so the instantaneous intensity is referring to the pressure at that point in time. So at any one point in time on the graph, so you take one point in time, then the, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the intensity and the pressure at that point in time. And you might look at a different point, the different pressure points. So you might look at positive, negative, you, you know. So this is, um, uh, at, at, at this point in time, it's related to that pressure at that point in time. But what I think you're getting at is that we have some other terms that we often deal with, which is, for example, what's the average intensity um, averaged over time? Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we say um, that if this lower, so the upper plot is a sinusoid, the lower plot is a sine squared. And so we know that the average of a sine squared is a factor of a half. So then that just means that um, it's the, the peak pressure here squared over Z, and then a factor of, of a half that gives us our average intensity uh, during the pulse. So what we say here is that this, this number is uh, not um, changing over time. It's just the, the peak pressure. And you take the peak pressure squared, divide by two times the acoustic impedance, and that gives you the average. And again, this I average is not changing over time. It's the average over, over that pulse. Okay, so um, that's our, our time average. Now you can talk about time average over different amounts of time. So you could talk about uh, a time average that's over the pulse. So that's the pulse average. Um, or you could talk about uh, not just over the pulse, but the dead time that might be comes after a pulse. And so then that would be the temporal average. And so there's different um, averages that you can refer to. There's a definition, a few other uh, things here. So what I'm showing you is a couple of pulses. So there's the, the pulse duration shown here, uh, that this is the pulse duration. And then this is the pulse repetition interval or the PRI. And um, what we see is the, the pulse repetition frequency is one over the PRI. That's how often we're repeating the pulses. The duty cycle is another term that's very useful. So it's the pulse duration divided by the pulse repetition interval. So oftentimes we see with ultrasound uh, uh, neuromodulation that 
people will use a continuous wave pulse. So that would be just one pulse that's on for a length of time and then turns off and not repeated. And sometimes we see people using pulsed wave. Pulsed wave is what we show here, where there's a pulse and then there's a dead time and then a pulse and a dead time, et cetera. And so um, with pulsed wave, oftentimes there, we talk about duty cycle and that's sort of the fraction of the time that the pulse is on. So if the pulse is on for half the time, it's 50% duty cycle. Sometimes people talk about how different um, duty cycles do different things with neurons. And I think we have a whole lecture on this, perhaps. <laughs> I think it works its way into a lot of lectures. Um, and as you'll learn, there is much to be discovered. So Kim in her own lab is examining some of these features you know, right now. Yeah. Cool. So it's a little bit of an open story as to what does it, what effect does duty has cycle have when you apply that to um, the brain? But we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Okay. So shall I move on? Mm -hmm. it, oh, I kind of talked about this already. Continuous wave. Uh, it's just one, uh, uh, you turn it on and you, you leave it on for a long time versus the pulsed wave where it's split up into individual pulses. There's pulse duration, pulse repetition interval. Yes. We could just, we could make the quick comment to say the reason people might pulse a wave instead of doing just a really, you know, compressed long single wave is because you may need to spread the treatment out over time, you know, to make sure the effect continues to happen. Or that if you compress the wave, you might get too much heat in the brain and you can actually damage tissue doing that. So that, that's the reason these come up and, and we'll talk about different schemes. Around yeah, this. we'll have to talk about that um, because if you, um, you pulse it, but your time average is the same as if you had continuous waves and your heating is the same. And so you haven't really gained anything. What you've gained is allowed your pressure to go up for the same time average. But you know what? <laughs> well, the, the peak temperature could be different because the inner pulse period allows temperature to drop. So if you just had it on, like if we, maybe, oh, maybe we could do a, a class you know what? homework. We're going to do some homework on this. <laughs> and I think we're going to make you do the homework too, Keith. <laughs> I will do it. I'll do that homework. But I could, I could show that scenario where that might happen. Okay. All right. Let's talk, we're getting down to the end of the lecture. Let's talk a little bit about the frequency content of pressure waves. And so this is really um, kind of important. There's a lot of jargon that we kind of tend to throw around and let's, so let's just define some of these things. So, okay, here's our tuning forks. So um, uh, let's ping our tuning fork. Um, and so that's the idea. I don't know, you probably don't have a tuning fork handy, do you, Keith? Um, I have my phone, I can like... <laughs> No, I don't have any of that. <laughs> All right, so you ping the tuning fork, and this isn't such a great example, but uh, I think everybody's probably played with one before, and you know that if you ping the tuning fork, then it's gonna ring and ring and ring. And so that's the idea. There's a single frequency, different tuning forks have different frequencies. So what's happening is shown in this graph where um, it's gonna vibrate, and when it vibrates, it sends out a compression wave. Of course, that compression wave, you get picked up by the ear, et cetera, we talked about that. All right, but this is a sinusoid of the, this is the pressure over time, and it's showing you that pressure wave. Now, if you were to say, well, what's the frequency content of that? What we mean is, you, you know, it's a, a single frequency. So let's say this is one kilohertz, then uh, there's gonna be, a sinusoid at one kilohertz. And so if you plot out like how much sound there is at each, at each frequency, so this is gonna be our frequency axis here. This is our time axis over here. If you plot out, well, how much sound there is at the different frequencies, you're gonna see that with a tuning fork, it's really gonna be right around one kilohertz. And so you're gonna see this peak right here at one kilohertz. And so that's the idea with the frequency spectrum is that you are able to look at the frequency content of the sound. And in this case where it's sort of continuous wave and it just goes on and on for a while and it's just a pure sound at one kilohertz, then the frequency content is really narrow and it's just really right around one kilohertz. But now I'm gonna show you some other examples. What about the situation where I wasn't holding it uh, by this string, but instead I'm gonna hold it like this and now I ping it and I don't know if you probably can't hear it, but you know what's gonna happen is that it's not gonna sound for very long. It's not gonna ring for very long. It's gonna, it's, my hand is damping down the sound. 
So when it do that, then it looks more like this. It's going to start out as a sinusoid at that one kilohertz, but it's going to get damped down very quickly. And because now it gets damped down very quickly, then it's not just the, the one kilohertz uh, uh, oscillation. It's one kilohertz modified by something else that's going to damp it down. It means that we have broader frequency spectrum. There's not just the one kilohertz, you know, it's kind of centered around one kilohertz, but there's more frequency components. In other words, you damp it down, shorter pulses, more frequency components, and it, the, in, in the frequency content has broadened. Okay. Um, so the, it's still centered around our fundamental frequency in this one case of one kilohertz. You know what? You could have just used your phone instead of me dink, dinking around with my tuning <laughs> fork. Um, I did this actually. So I have a recording that there's this really nice application on the phone and you can tell it to play different frequencies. So I'm gonna play a recording in which I told it to play these different frequencies. And I'm gonna ask you to listen as we step through. And um, after I turn it on, and as we step through it, I'm going to point to the frequency that I think we're at. Okay. Okay. All right. Could you hear that last one, Keith? I could. You could. Oh yeah, I have excellent hearing. Uh, I've, I've done this on my uh, phone too. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So your hearing is way better than mine because I can hear that seven uh, kilohertz, but I could not hear the 14 kilohertz. My, my hearing just really cuts out around 13 kilohertz. But um, here's the key point here is that as we do that, it's showing you the frequency components. So this is a function of time. And then it's showing you the frequency spectrum this way. And it's a pure sinusoid at these different frequencies. And so that's what it was showing us. Those 220, the 440, um, the 880. So right here is about the 880. And then it goes up to about um, 1760 right here. And it's showing us uh, the frequency components over time as we stepped through those different frequencies. So that's really cool that you can get a picture. I love pictures. You know, this is why I like, have to draw all the time. Whenever I talk, I can't talk without drawing. Um, but I love pictures. And so this gives you a picture of the frequency components as we were stepping through those frequencies. Now, that last one at 14 kilohertz was off the scale here. Um, it doesn't really matter. I couldn't hear it. If I can't hear it, I can't see it. It's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't see it. <laughs> All right, so it's showing us the frequency content over short periods of time. All right, and notice how the 14 kilohertz is way up there, the top end of your, your hearing. So humans can hear typically from about 16 hertz to about 16 kilohertz. Mine only goes up to 13. Um, but that's really kind of interesting because, uh, first of all, we define ultrasound as frequencies that are above 20 kilohertz. Um, it's, you know, above human hearing. And it's also very interesting because we can also say that, you know, look at the uh, hearing sensitivity of different animals. And so I talked about humans right there going up to about 16 kilohertz. Here's the mouse hearing sensitivity. And it turns out they are most sensitive to 16 kilohertz. And in fact, uh, something from about four kilohertz on up to uh, at the top end, uh, about 32 kilohertz, maybe even up to 64. So they can hear much higher frequency sounds than we can. In fact, their hearing really cuts off at the low end at about one and a half kilohertz. So we can hear a ton of things that they can't hear from 16 hertz all the way up to one and a half kilohertz to two kilohertz. Do you know what the lowest frequency a whale can hear is? Oh, no, I don't know it off the top of my head because, but I, I've seen plots of them. I, I imagine they're pretty darn low. I don't know what it is. So I just wonder if you knew. Oh. <laughs> it's low. I think we can Google it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about um, confounds, is that, you know, when you think about the lab setup and trying to make the lab setup sort of um, quiet, that there may be frequencies that we can't hear, but the animal can hear. And so then it's kind of a problem, like how do you even measure, you know, if I can't perceive it, how do I know that it's loud for the mouse? 
can I measure it? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, the phone, for example, can measure frequencies, but really it's optimized for human frequencies. And so it's not really set up to tell me about what the mouse can hear. <laughs> someone, someone once told me the, the mice can hear me rubbing my fingers together. And I just like never even thought of that as a sound generating thing. I, I stopped. I don't know if I was ever rubbing my fingers together, but I definitely am not now. Ah, interesting. Six, 16 hertz, Kim. That's the lowest that a whale can hear. Oh, okay. Well, that's unbelievable. Right. That's okay. so low. All right. So the, the point here, it's kind of a long digression, but the, the point was ultrasound is defined as those higher frequencies than we can hear. And just get back. Oh, to I thought you were going to talk about Q here. No uh, Q maybe. Okay, let's talk about Q. Important. That's so important. if you're in the situation where you've got that tuning fork and you're using the string so that it can just kind of ring and ring and ring, then that's what you have at the upper plot. And then the case where you hold it, so it's damped down, you've got the lower plot. Now we can define bandwidth. Bandwidth is if you sort of look at um, uh, halfway from the peak and then what's the range of frequencies halfway down and then that's the bandwidth. So in the case where it's damped down, it has a wider bandwidth than the case where it wasn't damped down. And now Q, whoops, it's down underneath this thing. The Q is the ability to ring. So it's gonna have a high Q when the bandwidth is low. And so um, here our, is our definition of Q. It's one over the bandwidth. So in other words, when the bandwidth is, is big, then that means the Q is low big bandwidth, low Q. All right, so that's our definition of Q. And sometimes we want the Q to be low with ultrasound. So in fact, with diagnostic ultrasound, we want a low Q because we want a short pulse. A short pulse is gonna give us high spatial resolution in the image. Oftentimes with um, our transcranial ultrasound for stimulation, we want a high Q because we want pulses that are gonna last not for a couple of cycles or a couple of microseconds, we want it to last for a millisecond, which is a long time, a very long pulse. And so we really usually want high Q. And when we talk about transducers, we can talk about some of the trade-offs and how you can get high Q and low Q. All right, so frequency content, so just some examples. Here's a pulse that's going on for like a millisecond or so. It's long in the time domain. Uh, so this is the time domain here. It's long as in it's going on for a whole millisecond. So that means it's very narrow over here in the frequency domain. We have one now, this is now, it, it changes here because instead of being in the millisecond scale, it's now on the microsecond scale. So it, this is like one, one tenth, it's a hundred uh, microseconds. And what we see is that it's now broader in the frequency domain. And then here's another example where um, what we've done now is in the time domain, um, oh, actually, I, I think that's still 100 microseconds. Uh, yeah, here, I, um, I've shortened it up so it's a even fewer number of cycles and we see that it's even broader in the frequency domain. And so this kind of reciprocal, what gets narrow in time domain gets broad in frequency domain. Okay, so referred to as broadband then. Um, Okay, yep, so damped down, um, as you can see right here in this lower one where it's damped down, then it's gonna have sort of broad components. And if it's smoothly damped down, then you can see that it doesn't uh, um, have components that sort of ring into multiple frequencies as you do right there. So this is the case up here where it's kind of a, a rectangular envelope and a rectangular envelope means that you're gonna have sort of a um, these, these tails that, that um, emanate for a long distance. Okay, and we might talk about that a little bit more later too. Um, these are a few Fourier transform pairs. Um, and so these are some of the things that we've talked about um, already, believe it or not. Um, we talked about the fact that if you have a, a sinusoid, for example, then uh, when you look at the frequency content of a sinusoid, then it's very narrow band. It's really just a delta function. Um, never mind the fact that I've got these on both sides of the, the zero axis, and sometimes they're positive and negative. But um, what we did talk about was a, a pure sinusoid is gonna be very narrow band, and then you're gonna get something that's just sort of a delta function or a cosine 
Um, that's going to be narrow band. And then you see right here is just the delta function. Um, we also talked about um, in the last slide, and let me just back up so that you can see it, is um, that if you have something that's sort of a rectangle, then the Fourier transform of that is a sink. Sink looks, uh, a, it's a sine over, uh, it's a sink is defined as sine x over x. And what we see is that uh, it's kind of like a sine, but then it's sort of diminishing um, side lobes. And that's what we see over here, where we see those frequency components are kind of um, going a long distance from the, the main lobe is because we have that rectangle right here and we're convolving our, our delta function with a sink. So a bit of terminology there, but um, that's what we had seen before. Uh, we, we multiply times a rec, and then we had those frequency components going a long distance. Um, there's other uh, aspects to these Fourier transform pairs, and we'll introduce them as they come up in the class. And at this point, unless you have anything you want to say at this point, Keith, I think I'm just going to go in and conclude this lecture. I think it was a, a great lecture. Lots to take in. <laughs> okay. We actually, so we didn't stop this lecture once. I don't know if Kim's going to break it up in the postscript, but uh, I hope you're proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> I was fine up until that point. Um, <laughs> this is a bad joke about like hair or something. Oh, your sinuses and your hair. Uh, okay, let, so let's you just missed say. it because Kim cut it out. I'll bring it back up. <laughs> we talked about a lot of things. We talked about waves and pressure waves and characteristics of pressure waves and intensity and frequency content. This was action packed. Um, next. <laughs> Next lecture is going to be action packed as well. We're going to talk about skulls. And one of the really important things to talk about with skulls is attenuation. So in some ways I could title next time the acoustic properties number two, but I don't know. I'm going to call it skulls. So we got that oh, to score too. I love it. All right. That's it for today.